Hello, everyone. Jonathan Alexander here with the Los Angeles Review of Books, and I am very honored to have with me today Pamela Sneed, who is an American poet, performance artist, actress, activist, and teacher. We're going to talk specifically today about her book, Funeral Diva, which is a memoir in poetry and prose <laughs> about growing up during the AIDS crisis, and it was a winner of the 2021 Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Poetry. Pamela, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. No, it's my, my pleasure. I, uh, as I told you before we started recording, I, I love this book. It is a powerful, powerful document and one that's very timely. Uh, it really is a memoir in, in verse and in uh, kind of prose poetry and speaks so much about not only you having gone through the height of the AIDS epidemic and you seeing so many friends and associates dying of AIDS, but then also you come to the most recent moment in the, in the current pandemic and, and COVID. And so first, congrats on just being able to help us make sense of all of this. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But for those of us you know, who grew up under what I call, grew up under the sign of AIDS with our, our queerness very much impacted and affected by uh, the disease. Tell me a little bit about what 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 drove you to write this book right now in this particular moment? Because you're talking about so many things that happened in in many ways decades ago. Why this book right now for you? Mm. <laughs> well, okay, uh, like funeral diva. I mean, actually, you know, the seeds of it started like I think right after nine eleven. You know, and um, and it was a really rough time in my life. And um, and so the title piece, you know, Funeral Diva, definitely was something that I had started then. Like, you know, some of the prose, more prose pieces were pieces that, you know, um, I started a long time ago. They've developed over time. Um, but basically, you know, so it was always in my consciousness to write about my friends, you know, like who died because, you know, there was just like the sense of like, you know, living through the AIDS era and like everybody was just like, oh, forget it, move on. You know, it's only in the last, yeah. like say five years or so that people are actually talking about it, you know, and that like, there's a lot of art around it. I mean, before we had Angels in America, you know, I mean, on Broadway and like, that's it, you know? And certainly not from the perspective of like, you know, black lesbians or anything like that, you know? And so it was such a fundamentally, uh, you know, uh, formative time for me that, that I couldn't just move on, you know what I mean? Like I lost all of my friends, I lost my peer group. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, the opening lines to Allen Ginsberg's Howl, you know, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed, you know, and, uh, and I did. And so, so I've always wanted to write this book, like, and, and it was a commitment to document the lives of like black lesbians and gays who, you know, who in the early nineties had, you know, died of cancer and AIDS, you know, because um, cancer like decimated the women. And, um, and there's no, you know, there's no, there has been no real document, you know, for us, right? And so, uh, and I was like, you know, somebody needs to document this time, you know? Um, you know, we exist is so, so important, you know? Um, so literally my commitment, you know, so I was like talking about like wanting to do this long before, you know, anybody was paying attention to, you know, that era, do you know yeah. what I mean? So, um, so in that way, I feel like I pioneered a little bit um, and had that commitment. Um, so, and I think maybe just everything just like congealed, you know, um, I've been in conversation with Amy Shoulder, who, you know, who basically is a producer on Disclosure, and Amy's pretty much a pioneer. She was at like, you know, Feminist Press, and um, she published, you know, Justin Vivian Bond, and uh, before that, you know, Karen Finley uh, with City Lights, uh, Sapphire, I think, uh, you know, with High Risk Books. Um, and so, you know, Amy has always been sort of like, you know, a visionary, and I think like outside of the box. And, um, and we'd been in dialogue and, um, you know, 
uh, off and on through the years and, and, you know, nothing really worked out, but, um, but basically, you know, she was interested in my work and like, I always trusted her, you know, I was like, you know, I know she knows what she's doing. So if I was ever working on something, I'd say, Hey, Amy, you know, I want to take a look at this. And, and um, I was in dialogue with a big press and like they, uh, and then it finally like, dropped it didn't happen and then I was talking to Amy about it and she said well let me see what I can do and um you know I think she felt like you know that it was the time she had seen my work like over years and I think that um she felt it was time I mean I think she's like a very instinctual person you know what I mean and so it's like you know, it was something that was congealing or coming together for a long time. And then, you know, a lot of it was uh, work that I did in the last couple of years too, you know, so it was just, it was a culmination of a lot of different things. Yeah. And then it was like Stacy at City Lights who asked me, you know, uh, how I was going to, you know, address, uh, you know, the pandemic and, um, and my, you know, the present pandemic, and then, you know, HIV AIDS, how I would speak to those two things. And it was funny, because I was thinking about doing a book just, uh, you know, solely on the pandemic. Mm. And, um, and basically, um, and I said, well, I have this work, you know, and that's when that, you know, all that work went into, you know, funeral diva. So they just came together pretty naturally. Yeah. No, it totally makes sense. I, I'm, I'm wondering if g given the, the large interest right now in the height of the AIDS epidemic, those decades ago, in, in part, I think fueled by, by the COVID pandemic, but also because we've gotten a little bit of time, a little bit of distance. We can look back, reflect on that time. I'm thinking of course, right. Sarah Schulman's Leather Record Show, Political History of Backup in New York, which just came out to a lot of a lot of fanfare. But I tell you, one of the things that your your book does, and, and one of the reasons why I'd point people towards Funeral Diva, is it really does pay homage to all of the black lesbians and black gay men who aren't given sufficient recognition. I'm thinking you mentioned David Frechette, Donald Woods, Asato Saint, all of these amazing people who I don't think have stayed in the, in or could have penetrated to the public consciousness in ways that maybe other folks like David Wojnarowicz, for instance, has. And so I sense in your work, a desire not just to recover, but to deeply honor the people who were lost at that time. And I think that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And I mean, you know, and not to be sort of like a footnote, you know, like people will yeah. mention, yeah. you know, Essex, you know, so like there'll be like one, yes. you yeah. know, and um, like, I guess uh, the first time I was actually ever asked to speak publicly was uh, Ishmael Houston Jones. Um, I mean, to speak publicly on the AIDS crisis was, um, you know, when Ish did, uh, what is it? There was a downtown platform mm. devoted to the, like the AIDS era. And he asked me to, you know, basically curate an evening. And I also asked like Terrence Taylor because I wanted like a living black man who yeah. lived through that time to actually speak because they're always like spoken of, but it was just like, I feel like this era needs to be, uh, narrated by somebody who like survived it and like a black man who's not being spoken about but like a real black man who's like living you know um and that's been a problem too like you know uh different you know uh, museums and people have like done things um and like they don't have like a black man you know speaking or uh, you know a latino man latinx you know asia i mean forget it you know and so I mean, even in this time, you know, and um, and I'm shocked at that, you know, and I'm shocked, you know, that like a lot of my peers and my friends won't even speak to that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it still yeah. has to be it still has to be me who say, oh, excuse me, uh, wait a minute. You know, uh, there's something missing. Um, but yeah, I wanted them to have like a real, you know, space. Uh, yeah, and the, and the women too, you know, but it was like the first time I think Ish asking me to do that was the first person who ever acknowledged that like, you know, a woman of color 
you know, a lesbian, like, you know, had a voice or had, you know, that was impacted by the AIDS era. Right. You know, I think he was the first person that ever asked me to speak on that in particular. And that was a kind of marginalization, you know? Yeah. It was really sad. Do you think of yourself as a survivor of that time? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I don't have HIV AIDS, but like basically to just come through that period, you know, where everybody, I mean, you know, I was a really young person, a lot of everybody, they were all babies, you know what I mean? And like, to just be decimated in that way, you know, just when they're coming to voice and um, changing the world, and then it's like, and then just gone, you know, and it's just like, it was so devastating. So yes, I'm a survivor. And I was just th like thinking about you know, like actually this morning, you know, I was thinking uh, there was something I wrote a long time ago, is, um, which was a, there was a line that said, you know, my life spent surviving, there'd never been time to sift, there'd never been time to plant, you know, and like, you know, that line came back to me. And um, because, you know, now I'm starting to like, look forward, just like the first time in my life, like I, you know, like making a plan, like, you know, when people are like, oh, what do you want to do in 10 years? You know, what do you want your life to look like? Like, I'm just now, I've survived so much and I've had to come through so much that it's just now that I can like sit down and say, oh, this is how I would like to shape this time. Because before it was just, I just had to survive it. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh, you know, where are you going to live? And what what partner shall you have? And like, it, it's none of that. You know what I mean? It was just trying to get through to the next day. Absolutely. You know? Especially given that one of the delights and challenges of, of queerness is that we don't have ready-made lives for us. <laughs> We're already making it up <laughs> as we go along. Right. Right. So, right. Yeah. The other thing that you do beautifully in this book, and I want to I want to reference uh, uh, and quote from one of the the poems, "Hold Tight," uh, mm. is that is that you don't write just about the 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 time of of AIDS. This is a poem about the uh, shooting at the Pulse uh, nightclub in Orlando, and you write on the Orlando shooting. Let's be clear. It was an ISIS or Islam that licensed that man to walk into a gay bar and massacre, massacre those white and gay POC. It was America with heinous gun laws that allow any white or white skinned man with mental health problems to purchase weapons of war. Mm -hmm. And this is the other refrain in your book, the other kind of thematic that comes through, which is that over and beyond AIDS, <laughs> we're, we're already living in a in, in a culture, in a society, a country that has been lethal for people of color. And I think you you, you beautifully bring beautifully maybe as a strange word to, to use, but you compellingly bring these things together. And I'd love to hear a little bit more anything you have to say about about the nexus, the, the sort of collision of of seeing AIDS and the neglect. Uh, of people with AIDS, especially in the 80s and the 90s, as just another another instance of uh, our culture's war on people of color. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a lot to say, but you know, like I again, I was thinking this morning. <laughs> yeah. I never stop thinking, right? But um, I was thinking about like. Uh, there needs to be like, you know, people are talking about uh, what is it? Abolish the police. Well, I feel like uh, there needs to be, we need to abolish this healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Like there needs to like this, like there needs to be uh, a complete like reckoning. I mean, you know, it's as criminal and as corrupt as the police force, you know? And I mean, it's interesting that like America's like all of, all of their, you know, most fundamental, you know, organizations and structures and systems are just absolutely, I feel that it's as corrupt as like the policing institution. I th feel like it fundamentally needs to be revised. And I mean, that's like, you know, 
that's been coming out with like, you know, the, uh, what is it? The, you know, um, COVID, you know, that like they're saying things like, oh, you know, there are so many inequities in the healthcare system. And it's like, what are you talking about? You know, like having come through the AIDS era, I mean, and what's been done to women in the system and what's been done to people of color, you know, like, uh, what is it? Um, Chris, Chris Rock, yeah, makes a joke about how his, his uh, grandmother uh, or his mother had to go to a veterinarian to have her teeth taken out mm. you know so it's just kind of like because they couldn't find a doctor to treat her you know and so I mean people like make you know jokes and stuff like that but I mean it speaks to something that is horrifically wrong and so I mean I say that in a tale of two pandemics you know that that this needs to be a there needs to be a medical me too yeah. you know and um and it needs to come out and so I'm 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 infuriated about it, you know? Um, so that's one of the things that I've been thinking about, like all of these, like, you know, things together because people are like, oh, you know, like treating, you know, the inequities in the healthcare system as something so new, you know? <gasps> I'm shocked, I'm surprised, you know? And it's just like, yes, you know, great. and then the people who are and the people who are dying, you know, again, are people of color, you know, are women, you know? whatever anybody poor working class you know what i'm saying and so i just feel like the the medical system has gotten away with a lot you know and it's like yeah. we're looking at policing like the next frontier needs to be to, to dismantle this medical system i i couldn't yeah. agree more it's been so interesting experiencing this during the pandemic because you know i i work at a at an institution which I think a, a genuinely, genuinely good institution that is trying to do right by its employees, but there have been definitely moments when the, the the rhetoric around, you know, encouraging people to get vaccinated hasn't always paid attention. And, and I believe in, in getting vaccinated, but it hasn't yeah. paid enough attention to that queer people, people of color, sometimes they're going to be a little skeptical. Of right. these kinds of medical mandates, uh, because right. we're justly skeptical of institutions that have not always been good to us or good right. for us. And so right. it's been interesting to kind of find the voice to talk about these issues uh, in these larger spheres and, and let colleagues know we gotta be we gotta be thoughtful in how in how we are encouraging people to take care of each, take care of themselves. Because right. Not everybody has the same level of trust or should have the same level of trust in right. institutions. So this mm -hmm. is this has been a delightful conversation. I've only got two more questions. First, I want to ask about your background picture, which I love. I follow you on Instagram and have been enjoying your watercolors. I know you've been doing this uh, practice, art practice for a while. How is this part of, how do you understand this as an extension or as key core to you as an artist well one i mean i think that there's something very sensual about um you know about like making things with your hands about things that are tactile you know and uh like paint and glue and you know all that i mean that's how we engage you know in sex and stuff like that and so me being a passionate person <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I mean, it makes sense that, like, I like to work with my hands, you know, it's very physical, it's very erotic, it has all of those components, and I mean, again, the sensitivity, the touch of, like, poetry as well, you know, in the beginning, it was interesting, because people were like, oh, you're not new, because I've been practicing, I guess, six or seven years, and people were like, you're not new, I mean, you'd be a text-based artist, and I was like, no, 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 you know, I don't want to be a text-based artist, you know, like I just wanted to I wanted to get away from language you know for a while and um and then the interesting thing is like now I feel like I don't know it's all come together and I feel like I'm making poetry like poetry and painting and everything it's all interrelated you know, so when I started, I was separating them. And now there's just this place in me and they're all like, you know, coming from that same place, you know, and there's so there's a real sense of like wholeness. And then all the principles that I apply in poetry, I also apply in painting, like creating those kind of refrains and, you know, what the color relationships are saying and the shapes and stuff like that. And so it's... um 
you know, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful uh, way of expressing myself, you know, and I started like, again, like taking all these classes, like you were also saying, <laughs> like during the pandemic, and uh, I'm working on a on a new book, actually. And, um, and one of the, uh, what is it, one of the things I was looking at it last night, um, like, there's a thank you poem or a praise poem for artists, you know, and, um, and I feel like artists have like, you know, lifted the heavy load of this pandemic, that we've been essential workers, you know, but like no one wants to recognize that, you know, and then again, like we've been called on to like save all the institutions that were meant to save us, you know, what I mean? <laughs> so it's just kind of like, um hopefully we won't come uh through this pandemic and then people still say you know oh art is like a hobby or extraneous or you know um and people will understand because it's like you know when everything failed you know everybody turned to the artists you know what i mean yeah. or like everybody went back to art you know what i'm saying yeah. and that was the thing that led and that was the thing that soothed our spirits in this like uncertainty you know and people are like quitting their jobs and like you know not wanting to be in toxic environments and becoming more creative you know what i mean and so i'm hoping that art you know artists will be more valued you know, coming out of this pandemic or seeing the role that we played, you know, just adjusting syllabus, uh, you know, syllabi and like giving classes for free and, you know, everything is artists who, you know, who have shown up, you know, as well as those, you know, frontline workers, you know, food workers and like, you know, nurses and doctors on the front line. I mean, even though I'm like really hard on the medical system, I'm not hard on it. I'm just like, I'm, I'm truthful, but but I do, you know, know that there are people, you know, who've risked their lives, you know, um, and I appreciate that. Absolutely. We can appreciate, but also hold accountable right. institutions right. that need to serve us better. Yeah. Right. So who who is an artist or a writer that has really inspired you recently? Well, <laughs> well, you know, I teach a lot. And so my students are like my favorite uh but hmm, i would probably say i love jericho brown oh, yeah it's great yeah the mighty jericho is pretty awesome um and i think he won a pulitzer you know? oh yeah so yeah jericho brown is really awesome i really like uh Lainey long soldier whereas um who's also she's also a visual artist mm. um and so yeah um i'm trying to think if there's a visual artist well i'm very interested in like jennifer packer i think is like really you know pretty phenomenal stunning, stunning. Yeah. Yeah. An, yeah an exhibit of her work at the museum of contemporary art right now in los angeles and yeah i just I, I i'm chilled just thinking of it she's phenomenal so i encourage all of my local folks in the la area go to mocha see this exhibit yeah she's she's amazing so right. pamela you are amazing and i really appreciate the time to okay. chat with you i've been talking with uh pamela sneed who is the author of funeral diva definitely read it thanks so much for joining me thank you